Uh, so hi, everybody. Uh, as Dan stated, my name is Michael Rach, uh, and I'm the portfolio manager here at Fluke Biomedical, and I'll be one of your presenters for today's webinar, um, Uncomplicate Your Gas Flow Testing. Um, I'll also be joined by our global training manager, Jerry Zion. Uh, and over the next hour, we're going to jump into a handful of topics that should help you out. Um, so with that, I just wanted to jump into what we're going to cover today. So we're going to cover a broad range of topics, like I stated, uh, over the next 55 or so minutes. Um, but we'll start with the definition of medical gas flow devices. Uh, and then we're going to paint a picture of what they all measure, uh, as well as what can go wrong with those measurements. Uh, and really touch on what that means clinically. And finally, what we're gonna do is we'll wrap up with how you can make the testing of those parameters less complicated to reduce those risks. Um, so that was a brief overview, but with that, uh, we'll jump right into today's con uh, content. So I wanna start with stating that medical gas flow devices are more than just ventilators. I know vents have been top of mind in the past few years, but there is so much more that deals with medical gas flows, pressures, volumes, and concentrations in the hospital setting than just ventilators. Um, and this doesn't just mean types of ventilators. Uh, so when I talk about that, think about pediatric ventilators, high frequency ventilators, critical care ventilators, and so on. Um, this means everything else that deals with medical gas flow in the hospital. Um, such devices could deal exclusively with pressure, right, take an excephalator. Um, maybe you're just testing flow on a wall regulator. Um, others might be for home use. A CPAP is a good example of that. Um, but think about the parts of medical devices that might need testing as well. Uh, anesthesia machines need the vent and the vaporizer to be tested. Um, and I'd also push you to consider those applications that are less obvious. So think about pneumatic drills, patient bed mattresses, these all require uh, routine maintenance and they all deal with medical gas flow. So like I said, there's more than just vents. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to bring Jerry in to see if he had any additional thoughts to, as we kind of talk about the category. Yeah, we, we so often we run into our, in our conversations with each, with customers like you, um, who are focused, just laser focused on ventilator testing or anesthesia system testing. And, it, and, and you, it, this is easy to forget that there are all these other medical gas flow and pressure devices in the hospital. If you're uh, an independent service provider or a field service engineer, each of your client sites will have this variety of medical devices that really need to be tested periodically. What is that frequency of inspection? It will vary depending on which of these devices and what is the risk-based assessment or the manufacturer's recommended frequency. Um, could be once a year or some of these uh, might be low enough risk that they might be tested on incoming inspection, tested after repair, but aside from that, you're gonna run it till fail. Of course, you won't do that for ventilators and anesthesia systems. Um, and there are others uh, on this list that you would not run till fail either. However, they need testing and you're gonna need test equipment to do that. And what we're gonna try and help you with is figuring out how to uncomplicate the amount of test equipment you've got in your cabinet and whether it's portable enough or not. Well, thanks, Jay. That's a great segue uh, after, the, uh, after the intro because we wanted to jump into the first poll question of the day which does have to do uh, with test equipment. Um, so we're curious to hear how many test instruments you're currently using to test the medical gas flow devices uh, in your work setting. Um, are you using one device to do everything, two, three, uh, or four or more? Um, we'll pull the poll open now and put in your answers. We're curious to hear how many gas flow test equipment pieces you're using to complete everything in your in your work setting. Some of you mm -hmm. might want to throw into your question uh, in the quick Q&A box there, just uh, comment on uh, what kind of test equipment that you, you would be using. Um, just comma separated, that would be fine. 
This is a curiosity question. We always like to ask those. Um, and so please respond with whatever's happening in, in your world in your, uh, that, that you face every day. Great question, Jerry and Mike. And we're gonna give participants another five seconds to enter their reply. And then I'll close and share the response. Perfect. All righty, and here we go. The poll is now closing. And the results are, well, interesting. Let's see, 31% indicated one, 38 indicated two. And it was a tie for three and four um, instruments um, at 16%. Interesting. Very interesting. Good. Yeah, it seems I, like I, a bunch of people are using either one or two uh, devices to do all of their testing. Um, so I wanted to kind of ha urge you to think back to the last slide that I went all over. Um, and, and one thing, one, one kind of thought I want to put into your head is if you were to spread one single test device across that whole range of medical gas flow devices, just think about the effect that that would have on a few things. Um, for one, your time to break even on your investment, right? That would be faster. Um, your return on investment for that purchase would be better. Um, your learning curve in terms of teaching someone to perform testing on any one of these many medical gas flow devices would be shorter since it would be one tool and everyone would be trained on that. There are a lot of benefits to reducing the number of test tools you use uh, down to one. Um, so for example, when Jerry was uh, saying, you know, put down what you're using to perform testing, um, you don't need a digital pressure meter, right, uh, to do X and then a gas flow analyzer to do Y. Um, you really can buy one product that can do it all. And we're going to touch on that in a little bit, a little bit later in the presentation. Jerry, any thoughts before we move on? No, let's go. All right. So I alluded this uh, to this a bit earlier in the presentation, but there are four main functions uh, of medical gas equipment or four main parameters. Um, they measure flow, pressure, volume, and concentration. Uh, and I want to go into a bit of detail on each so we fully understand what they mean and how they're measured. Mike, can I interrupt just for a second? Absolutely. They, the medical device may indeed measure these parameters, but in many cases, the medical device is producing one or another of these parameters. So think about gas concentration and an oxygen flow meter. Yeah, it produces flow. It also produces some concentration of oxygen um, you may have a, a oxygen blender, which is going to mix air and O2 or nitrous oxide and O2, things like that. We certainly is going to measure um, pressure and volume in the patient, especially in terms of anesthesia systems. But uh, um, vacuum uh, suction devices um, and things like that uh, exert a negative pressure and there's a, a gauge um, so you can see how much negative pressure is being produced in order for them to do their work. So think in terms of all of that as Mike goes through these and the units of measure and so forth. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think your test device is going to do the measuring. Um, and yeah, it's either the it's the medical device that's either uh, producing it uh, or kind of, uh, you know, gating it or throttling it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so let's jump into flow. Um, and for each one of these, uh, I kind of have a definition here as well as units of measure. Um, so flows is, is defined as the volume of gas that passes a particular point in a particular period of time. Uh, so think about this as uh, runners crossing the finish line of a race. At the beginning, when the leaders are crossing the finish line, the flow is lower, right? There are less people crossing the line at any given time. Uh, but when you think about when I would cross the finish line with the other slow people, there's a lot of us crossing at the same time. That's high flow. So that particular point um, is the finish line. Uh, and, you know, the flow is the number of people crossing that. So people per minute would be the metric there. Um, but you'll see that gas flow is measured by liters per minute or milliliters per minute. Um, and do note that they're written differently. Um, so understand all the different versions whether it's LPM, 
or L slash M I N. Um, there are lots of different versions out there depending on the user manual, so don't get uh, mixed up with that. Um, but one running example I'd like to use across all of these parameters is blowing up a balloon, right? So flow would be how quickly the air is traveling from my mouth into the balloon through the opening of the balloon, right? Um, so that's kind of the first uh, example I want to give you there. Uh, pressure is the next one, uh, and that's the force exerted by gas particles colliding with the wall of their container. Um, you might remember P equals F divided by A, pressure equals force divided by area. Um, so the higher the force, uh, the higher the pressure, right, for a set area. And similarly, the smaller the area, the higher the pressure for a given force. Um, Mike, so head back the, uh, to, yeah, go ahead. In, in, in terms of pressure, we use the term container here. It's a good word. It's a very good word. It makes it real crystal clear. The container is what we're trying to, to produce pressure inside. Sometimes you'll hear that called a vessel. Mm -hmm. um, you'll remember a ship is called a vessel, but it's different than that. A vessel is a container. But if you ever hear that term, the pressure vessel, it just means the container. No, that's a great point. I mean, there's lots of terminology out here. So yeah, anytime you can think of something, Jerry, don't don't hesitate to, <laughs> to chime in because yeah, this can be, arguing is tough, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, but yeah, to make it a little easier, let's go back to that balloon, right? Um, pressure would be how, and this is in quotes, hard, right? The balloon becomes as the tension of the balloon itself pushes back on the air, uh, air pressure inside the balloon. Um, so we had the, the flow was how uh, the air traveling from me into the balloon. And now the pressure is how kind of hard, hard that balloon is. And in that case, the vessel is the balloon. Um, pressure, right, can be measured in bar, millibar, uh, PSI, or centimeters of water, right, depending on the service manual you're looking at. So even more uh, units um, to look at. So you might have to, uh, when you think about test equipment, uh, flex across those units, be able to switch those units on the fly. Um, so something to keep in, into consideration. So the next, the next one is volume, and that's the space uh, that a substance or object occupies. So in this case, it's how big that balloon gets. Uh, it's partially dictated by the volume of air in the balloon. Um, and one thing to note is all of these uh, parameters are interdependent to a degree. Um, but play with me here for the theoretical argument that, uh, you know, the volume will dictate how big the balloon gets. Um, and, and volume can be measured in liters, gallons, centimeter, cubic centimeters, right? Uh, even a cubic yard, right, would be a unit of volume. So if you think about, um, you know, throwing a yard, a cubic yard of, of soil, right, into the back of your pickup truck, um, the volume that contains is, um, you know, one yard by one yard. Um, so just different ways to visualize uh, the units here. And the last one uh, is uh, respiratory gas concentration. And we wrote it that way to include both oxygen concentration and uh, anesthetic agent con concentration, but also CO2 and N2O, as they're all medical gases. Um, so this is really the fraction of X that's dissolved or carried in a fluid, right? X being whatever um, that gas is. Um, and when we talk about fluid, in this case, we're referring to a gas. So it would be the fraction of CO2 that's inside the total volume of gas. Uh, and this is typically shown as a percentage of volume. It'll tell you how much of, of which kind of agent, right, uh, is in each unit of volume. So for the balloon, you might be able to measure how much CO2 is in that balloon from my exhaled breath. Uh, and if you really wanted to nerd out, you could infer how well my body is metabolizing oxygen from that, right, to a degree. Because um, there would be a proportion of CO2 in that balloon, a proportion of unused oxygen, um, you know, and a proportion of uh, nitrogen. So, um, it, yeah, there are different uh, percentages of each inside that balloon. But anyways, all joking aside, those are the four main parameters that are measured. Um, in medical devices, um, they do produce, right, or measure a mix of all of them, depending on what their function is. 
Um, so like I said, flow would be what a regulator uh, would focus on um, up to measuring all four of these when you think about an anesthesia machine. All right, so I talked a little bit on the last slide about the interdependency between all of those parameters. Um, and I do want to hit on it again. Um, and those uh, you know, relationships are defined by the ideal gas law, which is pictured here, um, and even Boyle's law. And those are the definition, the definitions of those relationships. Um, so ideal gas law, like I said, is pictured here and shows uh, you know, the effect that a change of temperature would have on either uh, pressure, volume, or both, and vice versa. Um, so it's, under, it's important to understand that an increase in temperature would cause an increase in pressure, volume, or both, um, and, and vice versa. So there are relationships between the gases that are really important to understand. Um, it's also important to understand how these parameters interact in terms of human physiology. Uh, so understanding how human breathing works. Um, so really, you know, uh, a breath flows into the lung, fills it with a volume of gas that exerts a pressure on the lung as it expands. And, you know, as I'm talking through this example, I bet you just thought about that balloon example that I gave you earlier, right? So you can see how the lung kind of acts as that balloon. Um, in these parameters, right, when they enter the human body, if they are, you know, too high or too low, um, they can cause damage. And, you know, I do want to get into that in a little more detail, and Jerry will guide us through that. Um, but I do want to share one example, which is ventilators, right? I think they're a really good example of, of how this all comes together um, because they're critical life support equipment and they have to be treated with respect as, as they control those parameters. Um, and the improper maintenance of those uh, medical devices can lead to patient harm or even death. Um, so when you think about the medical devices, these issues could be caused by the ventilator itself uh, and many times these issues can be easily preventable through routine maintenance. Um, and think about who's attached to the ventilator, right? It's a patient and they can rely partially or wholly on the ventilator for their breathing. So it's really critical that the ventilator is working properly because patient life is at stake. Um, so that's one example of how, how the medical device really does impact uh, patient safety. Um, and how all of those parameters kind of play together. But Jerry, what about other medical gas flow and pressure devices? What are your well, thoughts there? Let's move on to the next few slides and we're gonna go into it in some detail. Sure, sure. So let's move on. Um, and Jerry, how about you share a bit more detail on each parameter, um, yep. how it can fail and the impact it could have on patients. Sure. So first thing we're gonna talk about here is flow and there are, clinical disease states or chronic conditions that are that are not a failure of the medical device or the pay, or the test instrument but they affect the patient so if we if the patient has pulmonary fibrosis that is produces a scarring in the lung the lung disease occurs in the tissue becomes damaged or scarred it reduces the compliance of the lungs it makes the lungs stiffer it makes it more difficult to get gas exchange because you can't fill the lung units properly uh, because of the reduced compliance. They're really hard to fill. So you sometimes have to pick a different modality for delivering that flow, like a high frequency ventilator, which isn't so worried about the volume of gas produced in, uh, in the lung tissue as it is in, in uh, getting the the gas exchange to be happening. And we do that with a higher frequency of uh, delivery. Pulmonary edema is a going to, that's a swelling of the lung tissue. It's caused, it causes excessive fluid in the lungs. And again, we have a, a problem with compliance there um, that needs to be dealt with by using different modes of ventilation or ventilatory delivery. Acute respiratory distress, same thing. It, it's a buildup of fluid in the lung units, the alveoli, um, and so forth. But let's think about um, keeping to uh, respiratory uh, care, but let's think about a different 
medical gas flow device than a ventilator. If the patient's trachea or airways are filling up with fluid, uh, mucus, things like that, what's the medical instrument, the medical gas flow and pressure instrument that we would use or the clinician would use to get take away that blockage that, you, that will reduce the amount of flow and therefore the amount of volume that's able to be delivered into the lungs. What would that device be? It would, and this would have been a good poll question here too, Mike. <laughs> that would be a tracheal suction unit, suction device. So uh, I, I'm old school, I'm from a long way back, but whatever suction device would be used there could be a uh, wall suction or whatever, we're going to use that negative pressure to produce a uh, flow drawing that mucus or blockage out of the patient's trachea into a collection container to clear the airway. So what's important is the measurement there when we're testing that suction device, it is both, it, it's primarily the negative pressure that it can produce uh, in order to pull that very viscous, thick mucus out of the airway and put it into the collection container. That's just one example. Uh, flow in terms of a uh, laparoscopic insufflator. We need flow to go in, but we need a high enough flow rate to keep up with a very big leak because we're inflating the abdomen, for example, to do abdominal surgery, we need space for the surgical instruments that will be introduced through the, the abdomen into the abdominal space in order to do the work. So we need a flow rate sufficient to keep that uh, abdomen distended, inflated, if you will, and keep it inflated and, and not let all of that gas leak out of there. So just a couple of examples of flow that that we're going to want to be able to keep up with. Go ahead, Mike, to the next one. But in general, would you agree that you know we're trying to avoid kind of too sharp or too large of a flow? When it comes to ventilation, that's true. When it comes to other things, they're much more gentle and mild. Um, they're not um, um, even uh, 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 a, a vacuum curettage, which would be used for I'm sorry, would be used for abortions. Um, still is a rather gentle uh, suctioning in, in, in order to remove whatever the tissue is. So um, the, the big damage would be in terms of ventilation and, um, and, and too sharp, too, too high a pressure, too uh, sharp a flow, uh, a flow rate, yes, could do damage when it comes to that. All right, we'll move on to pressure then. All right, so pressure, if we have, like, again, we're starting with mindset of ventilation here. If we have too high a positive end expiratory pressure, we will reduce the, we will, we will, we will already create a problem for ourselves in proper gas exchange because we will reduce, um, it's possible to put enough pressure in the in the in the thorax to um, reduce the capacity the capability of the heart to push enough volume through the blood vessels in order to have this flow of of blood coming past the lung tissue to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide so too much peep here would be a problem could we collapse alveoli? If we create barotrauma, indeed we will because we'll destroy those small lung units. Barotrauma is kind of the same way. Too much pressure is not a good thing here. Too little pressure means we won't ventilate at all. And if we're worried about barotrauma because the uh, airways are, are blocked or the lung has a very low compliance, is very stiff, perhaps we pick a different clinical modality um, like high frequency ventilation in order to deal with that. In pneumothorax, we have a clinical condition where the lung has been penetrated 
by something. There's a wound that is causing an air leak and doesn't allow the lung therefore to inflate in a natural way. Because the way the lung would inflate is when your diaphragm moves downward, it creates a lower pressure in the thorax and the lung and uh, then it compared with the uh, outside air or um, whatever the um, source of gas coming into the patient could be a ventilator. And that uh, in a pressure ventilation modality, that causes, that difference in pressure causes an inflow into the lungs to try to fill the lung volume accordingly. Now, if we have this massive leak though, can't fill it. In fact, the lung won't fill at all because all of the alveoli are collapsed because of the leak. So there's an imbalance of pressure. Um, what would we do? Well, you gotta stop the leak. And so even on uh, first responders on first aid, the first thing you wanna do is cover whatever that wound is in such a way that it allows the lungs to inflate. Now it will be really hard. Maybe the patient won't be really well served in terms of ventilation and gas exchange, but you have to do something in that case. Now, none of these were caused necessarily by the medical device. And they certainly aren't caused by our test equipment, but um, we would need to verify the medical device is performing properly according to its minimum performance and safety specification. Okay, go ahead, Mike. So volume. Um, so if, if we try and put too much volume into the lung, for example, we can do damage. Um, there are other problems though that also produce damage and reduce the volume volumetric capacity of the lung, either by making it really stiff or by uh, creating uh, a swelling or, or one thing or another. Any severe inflammation is gonna produce fluid and, and swelling. And those things are, are clinical symptoms that would need to be identified by the doctor, the nurse or the respiratory therapist and dealt with accordingly. Um, these are not, uh, I want us to think about volume again when we think on the more broad general terms of medical gas flow and pressure. The volume that we need to produce, for example, um, uh, in, uh, again, let's go back to the laparoscopic insufflation. The volume we need to produce is enough to distend or, or expand inflate, if you will, the abdomen in order to make room for the surgical instruments and the manipulation of those surgical instruments so the surgeon can do their work. If we don't produce enough volume, and remember volume is gonna be a problem here because we have these big leaks that we create in order to have a pathway to introduce these surgical instruments. So the volume has to be big enough um, in order to uh, for the surgeon to do their work. Therefore, the pressure we need to produce in the insufflator and the inflow that we create into the abdomen need to be appropriate. And those are the parameters that we're measuring when we test the laparoscopic insufflator, okay? Um, so those are the things I want you to remember about that. Go ahead, Mike. Sure. So oxygen concentration or any concentration of respiratory gas is um, too little. It, we we will deprive the patient will be deprived of, of uh, oxygen and and, and um, asphyxiate. They, they'll too much would be hypoxemia where we have too low uh, concentration of oxygen in the blood. Why? Because we didn't put enough into the lung. However, remember we're testing medical gas flow and pressure devices. The device didn't cause these things. The device is some sort of delivery of uh, 
a mixture, an appropriate mixture of gases to the patient. So that could be through a nasal cannula, it could be through an oxygen mask coming from um, the wall, medical gas, medical gases, or from a blender, or from a ventilator or anesthesia system uh, through the vaporizers and, and the flow, uh, flow meters of the anesthesia system. So what we're measuring when we go to verify minimum performance and safety of the medical device is when we set a concentration of the mixture of gases that need to flow, when we measure that, is it what we set? Is it what was prescribed? Yes or no? If it's not, then there's a problem in the medical device. So in vaporizers, um, there are several problems that could occur. Uh, inappropriate gases because the interlock system of the vaporizers is not working properly. Therefore, we have two agents at the same time, not just one. That causes an overdose and the patient will die because um, of the potency of the drug gas or vapor that's being delivered to them. Um, and yeah, it has to do with oxygen. So if we don't, if there's not enough in, uh, anesthetic agent, however, delivered, not enough nitrous oxide delivered, it affects and, and increases the ability for awareness. The patient may feel pain, uh, certainly may feel movement, and there are other psychological effects that go along with that because they will be paralyzed and not able to move typically. If we over-administrate, we'll cause uh, over-deliver, we overdose, that'll cause cardiac arrest and death. So it's really important that we are gonna make those measurements uh, of the vaporizer uh, itself on some sort of testing system using our con uh, gas concentration analyzer or through the anesthesia system itself. For other purposes here, respiratory gas concentrations, typically we have um, respiratory gas monitors that are either built into a, mo a patient monitor, uh, a ventilator, or an anesthesia system that are gonna look at both inhaled and exhaled gases, including oxygen, CO2, and the like. So if we don't have, the, these are, uh, for CO2, we will have either a mainstream measurement which in which the measurement bench mounts right on the Y piece uh, where, where the patient is breathing and we see uh, concentration going in both directions. So we can get it that way. But more typically, we have a side stream sampling device. It could be a micro stream device at 50 milliliters per minute or less. It could be uh, it could be something at a higher uh, flow rate um, in and out of the patient. And we need to be able to verify that that device, that monitor is going to work properly. And there are ways to do that with um, canisters of uh, uh, certified concentrations of uh, the mixture of gases so that so you can properly test the concentration. In the case of, of uh, CO2, um, we're going to use, and, and anesthetic vapors, when we're testing that monitor, we're going to produce use the cylinders of certified test gas, but there's also the sample flow rate that needs to be tested, and sometimes the pressure, especially the back pressure, um, that would cause uh, uh, an alert or alarm about uh, uh, blockage, right, uh, about a blockage in the system. So those are the things that we're going to measure, and they're about things other than just the anesthesia system or just the ventilator. And I think when you hit on concentration, you you touched on quite a few medical devices there, right? Mm. You know, you hit on, you know, you could, you have you have the gases coming out of the wall, right? You have your ventilators, you have your vaporizers, you have your respiratory gas monitor, your end tidal CO2 modules. Um, there's a lot there um, when it comes to concentration because there's just so much to measure. Um, and there are dangers on the high side and the low side, overdosing mm -hmm. and underdosing. So um, really important to, to spend some time on concentration. All right, so with that, 
I wanted to jump from understanding the risks over to uh, how we can uncomplicate your testing. Um, and you know, we, we've, we know about the parameters, we know about their risks, um, and we wanted to discuss uh, how we can make this all easier for you or help you make it easier for you. Um, and we bucketed this part of the discussion into three layers um, that we want to go into more detail on. So overall, this starts with having the right test equipment at its core, right? Um, upon that, you can build uh, and make sure you're using the right procedure with that equipment. Um, and if you really want to make your testing as uncomplicated as possible, uh, you should take a look at uncomplicating your workflow uh, and all of your tasks to be done. Um, so the first stop on this journey is the core in uncomplicating your test equipment. So that's where we're headed first. So to uncomplicate um, your, your test equipment, um, you need to get three things right. Uh, first, you need to choose the right test equipment. Uh, second, you need to standardize all of your equipment that's needed. Uh, and the third thing is to understand and document everything, which and in this point, we're talking about your connections uh, because they are different from model to model. Um, so before we jump into those three bullet points, um, I wanted to jump into the next poll question um, before talking about choosing the right test equipment. So with that, the question is, what types of equipment do you need to test medical gas flow devices? Um, A, electrical safety analyzer, B, gas flow analyzer, C, patient simulator, D, calibrated test lung, E, other. And Mike, that poll question has been launched and we will give attendees about 15 seconds to reply. Perfect. Responses are coming in. Oh, good. Once this again, will help. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks everyone for participating in our in our poll questions. Yeah, I think this will be helpful in guiding the rest of the, the conversation. So thanks for participating. Mm -hmm. And the poll is closing now and I'll share the results. Wow, there you go. 27% indicated electrical safety analyzer, 94% indicated gas flow analyzers, 23% um, patient simulator, 48% calibrated test long, and 6% other. All right, well, thank you for that. Um, the purpose of this question was to have you guys think about the entire application. Um, so your application might be different, right? Like I said, for a regulator, you might only need a gas flow analyzer to measure flow or a digital pressure meter to do the same. Um, but when you think about electromedical gas flow devices, devices that are plugged into the wall, um, you'll need electrical safety at a minimum. So it's always at least electrical safety and uh, a gas flow analyzer or a digital pressure meter. Um, as the application gets more complex, like an anesthesia machine, you'll also see additional things added on, like a respiratory gas monitor or a patient monitor, vaporizers. Um, all of a sudden, that gas flow analyzer that you needed at the beginning uh, might not cut it because it can't do the entire preventive maintenance uh, procedure. Um, so that's kind of my, my general thoughts. Jerry, any thoughts uh, from your end? The it, it, so it's not just any old gas flow analyzer because some of them are actually created to be ventilator testers, and they don't they're harder to use to make the connections for any other medical gas flow and pressure device. So that's why it's important to pick the right tools, and Mike will get into that a little bit later. The calibrated test thing you really only need when you're testing ventilators, including the anesthesia ventilator, um, uh, or uh, you might need it uh, if you're when you're testing uh, a home use uh, CPAP or BiPAP device, but more typically um, th there are other things so uh, that that you would need to use. So this is really good. I'm very pleased actually with uh, with this response. Most of you are uh, seem seem to be using many different test tools, not just one or two. No, that's great, yeah. And like Jerry said, it, it does come down to, to choosing the right test equipment. 
Um, so when you're thinking about your gas flow analyzer, think about all the medical devices you have to test in the hospital. Um, so can it test all of the parameters that all of those medical devices need to be tested as required by the manufacturer? Um, is the device easy to use and is it easy to learn and teach? Um, does it have the ability to store data for easy retrieval and reporting? Can you test all day and come back and do your reporting afterwards? Um, can you automate it? Can you transport it easily? Is it small? Is it lightweight? Um, and then going back to that question on return on investment, what, what is it? Is it good? Does it make sense? Um, and can you make that story a little bit better um, by being able to test more? Um, Jerry brought those brought up those connections with non ventilators. Um, does it allow for that? Does it make it easy? Is it convenient? Um, also, you know, think about what other medical gas flow testing needs this gas flow analyzer could fulfill, right? Um, besides the connections, does it have an integrated DPM digital pressure meter functionality, right? Does it compensate for temperature, humidity, and pressure? so that you don't have to. Um, there are some questions that as you look at, at devices, you should think about um, because they don't just have to be uh, ventilator testers, right? They really can be gas flow analyzers. Um, so these are all great questions um, to consider so that you can carry less to the job and ultimately do less while you're there. Um, and like I said, do, do think about those uh, economic efficiencies that I cited earlier in terms of making the learning curve shorter the ROI better and the time to break even shorter. Um, all good things to consider. The second kind of layer here is the additional equipment that you guys touched on in the poll question. So, um, you know, document and standardize all the equipment that you need. Um, if you're testing an anesthesia machine, you'll need a gas flow analyzer, a test lung, an anesthetic agent analyzer, and a patient simulator uh, to complete testing, as well as uh, your electrical safety analyzer. Um, if your hospital only has ventilators, you can drop that patient simulator because um, it likely doesn't have that functionality, but you'll need the rest. So whatever your medical device inventory is at your hospital, pick all the tools that are needed for your job and make sure you document which ones you're using. Um, I do want to say that we have a webinar on the importance and use of each of these pieces of equipment. Um, so do look at our webinar library to learn more. Uh, if you need. And the last part of your equipment are understanding the connections. Um, when you're testing medical gas flow devices, there are quite a few connections that need to be made um, and connections that need to be changed throughout the procedure. Um, these can include which adapter to use, whether it's 15 or 22 millimeters, where to place a filter, right? Um, if you want to extend the life of your gas flow analyzer, um, which end do you put it on? Uh, where do you connect the tubing? What side of the analyzer? Uh, where and when to use a test lung? Um, when to connect uh, to particular ports on the gas flow analyzer? High flow, low flow, uh, ultra low flow, pressure. Um, it's important to know when, where, and how to make these connections. And your procedure uh, is what should tell you these aspects of the test, but it's much easier if there are photos to help guide you. Um, or if there's a list of all the equipment need um, so that you're prepared when you go out to the job. So that's where I wanted to stop on um, your equipment. And then the next layer I kind of alluded to a little bit at the end there was uncomplicating your procedure. Um, and this means that you need to get your test requirements, your test frequency and lock them. Um, and, and before I jump in there, I wanna go a little bit deeper. Um, and kind of talk to it. Um, and I know this first one can be tough for us all. I know I don't always do it when I buy a new TV, um, but it's really important, which is to read and understand the manual. Um, you have to know the minimum performance and safety requirements for every brand and model of gas flow device you're testing. Uh, this will identify key parameters that need to flow into your own uh, pr procedure and best practices. Um, but you, examples are, what is the gas correction mode? Um, what tests do I need to carry out? Um, what does everything in the service manual mean? Going back towards human phys physiology or the relationship or the units. Um, there are questions that can come up and you don't know you have them until you read the manual. Uh, so following and understanding the manufacturer requirements is really key 
to making sure your testing is compliant uh, because it's derived from the international standards ultimately. The service manual is the minimum that you should perform in terms of testing, um, but you can always go above and beyond if your facility wants to uh, further ensure patient safety. So the service manual has got a lot of stuff in it, but the most important piece of it is, for, for this purpose, is the test procedure in the service manual. So if you're not allowed to have the full service manual, at least get the manufacturer's test procedure step by step that, that's, that's in that service manual because that is what should be your true guide as to what you're testing, um, how many tests, what kind of tests, where the connections are, all of that should be specified right in that test procedure. So at minimum, mm -hmm. get that test procedure. Yeah, and I talked a little bit about uh, test frequency. Um, this is something else that could come out of the service manual um, if it's stated there, right? But ultimately a consistent inspection frequency should be adopted and followed. Um, but there are circumstances that could present themselves where uh, testing needs to be done, but there is no information from the manufacturer in the service manual. Um, so in this case, you know, a ventilator category specific test procedure could be adopted uh, and documented as a deviation from policy uh, for your medical facility. Um, and we do provide an example here um, in these, this Medical Equipment Quality Assurance Program Development and Procedures, uh, which is a book by Toby Clark. Um, and this is available from Fluke Biomedical. And this book includes a process by which the proper frequency of inspection can be determined. Uh, so this process is kind of pictured here and it compares the criticality of a device's clinical function, its physical risk to the patient in, in, in its failure mode, uh, the ability to prevent such a failure, and the hospital or industry's history with this you know, ventilator brand and model, uh, as is pictured here. Um, so in this case, the ventilator is used as an example. Um, so it's a life support device that could cause death. Uh, failures are predictable and preventable. Uh, incidents have occurred in the past, uh, and the manufacturer does require testing. So in this quantitative analysis, it yields a score of 17, uh, which does call for it to require semi-annual testing. Um, and by the so way, is, uh, Mike, this is also available in our Advantage Training Center uh, under the MDQA, or Medical Device Quality Assurance uh, course series. So every chapter in the book that Mike uh, re referred to is a separate course within that part of advanced training, and you can earn certificates of completion. It will really help you figure out not only ventilators, but the, a lot of the other medical gas flow devices that you're gonna be required to test as well, and more. So please go check that out, sign up for access, and it's free. So there's no good reason not to do it. Yeah, and one final thought on this is is to note that test frequency, it doesn't always have to be a cal about a calendar date, right? Um, you might wanna consider a test frequency based on medical device usage. Um, and again, the facility can always go above and beyond uh, the minimum requirements to further ensure patient safety. And okay, so you've read the service manual, you determine your, fresh fre your test frequency, you just gotta set this procedure and lock it. Uh, so this procedure shouldn't change over time. And if you do change it, document why the change is happening. Um, ideally, uh, you know, you would put it into a, an automated test program and control that procedure to ensure that the steps are followed and not skipped. Um, but one other thing is it does, it would possibly give you the, the ability to look at your results quantitatively. Um, so if you follow the same procedure over time, you can track your results and see how they're trending. Uh, which is the first step towards predictive maintenance uh, and getting ahead of costly repairs and downtime. And um, there are changes that are that should be being sent to your hospital facility, whether it's your client site or to you, to your hospital biomed department, because manufacturers do change these procedures from time to time for very good reasons. And you need to make sure your procedure is up to date and whether you have their service manual procedure or not, they will send you changes to that procedure. You need to act on them and not just 
uh, lock it down for one version of that service manual test procedure and then ignore any other changes and changes occur over time when you're not complying with. So this is all about regulatory compliance as much as anything else. So be sure you're paying attention to that as well. All right. Thanks, Jerry. And I want to hand it over to you to bring us home uh, and talk about how you can uncomplicate your workflow. So a lot of us document uh, in many different ways. Uh, we document electronically. It would be really good to be able to automate testing in certain ways and to integrate that, um, that testing and the test results with the CMMS or our database. So Mike, if you jump on to the next one. So now we have a poll question. Again, this is a bit of a discovery. We always like to hear back from you. How do you presently record your QA preventive maintenance test results? How are you recording those results? Um, and A is a little bit flippant here, but there are actually some people that feel this way. Um, uh, documenting is a huge waste of time, or do you document only when it's needed for compliance? Hello, that's every time. I wish I had more time to create good documentation. Well, we could help with that and use documentation every day to do my job better. I hope we see most of you there. Let's see what, what the results are. And that poll question has been launched. We'll give attendees about 15 seconds to reply. And then that will be a good segue to lead into our Q&A session as we wrap up. So this is a great question, Jerry. Thank you. And the poll is closing now. I'll share those results. Oh, this is very satisfying to see. 76% of you say that you use documentation every day to do your job better. The real question and tricky question is, is it really helping you simplify your testing or not? And we're gonna jump into that now. So go ahead, Mike, go ahead with the next. So there are lots of, we need to unpack what, what it takes to make documentation of our test results easier. Um, the first one is about authoring our test procedure in ways that enable us to better uh, collect that um, the measurement information and the pass or fail information. Then we need to do that in a way that allow us allows us to easily review those test results, including a longer term trend of those results, and then when we're creating those workflows that the author is, is produced, we need a, an approval procedure, uh, an approval documentation that, um, that says anybody can kind of amend or create a, a, a workflow, a test procedure, but it needs to be reviewed formally within your organization and locked down and it should follow the manufacturer's procedure whenever possible. Even when you're doing an alternative equipment management program, there are some rules and guidelines that you need to follow. It's not just whatever you wanna do. It really needs to be based on, uh, on data and, and process. And then it needs to be easy to use. You need to be able to run this procedure very efficiently so it takes the least amount of time but the right amount of time in order to collect the measurements and the responses that you need in the workflow. So if you embrace automation, um, that helps a lot because it simplifies and strengthens version control number one, and that includes those manufacturer notifications you get. You get just one source of truth for all the documentation and the results are statistically sound because everybody does the testing the same way in the same flow and sequence. The reports are generated with little or no additional effort and the file, it files the reports more or less automatically for you and creates an archival backup as needed so you can go and find those results better. This drives a whole lot of things. Um, 
so it certainly drives compliance and our traceability in case of audits, and that's not just Joint Commission or um, VDE. Uh, it, it's it's also any other auditor. Do you realize FDA can come through your hospital and audit your hospital? Yes, and that's that's an audit that needs traceability of records. Trend analysis for moving from just preventive maintenance to predictive maintenance so we can help reduce the cost of maintaining those medical devices by finding problems early and getting more standardized ways to either adjust our inspection frequency or what we're testing or to just find those and correct those problems early while they're low cost. Therefore, we reduce costs in terms of time savings and cost of parts because we're replacing stuff while it's easy to replace. Visually guided workflows really, really help level the playing field from your most skilled people in the, in the department to the least skilled, least skilled to most skilled. So everybody is doing this work the same way, using the same test tools, um, and it needs to support not only those tools that are able to be automated by this electronic workflow, but those that are also not able to be, because not every test tool has a data port, right? So just think about that. So um, I wanna remind you that, you know, we have our Advantage Training Program, which is absolutely free, self-paced training. Just visit flukebiomedical.com knowledge center slash training to, to access all that, that great content. And, you know, it has quizzes, white papers, application notes, there's videos, ROI calculators built into that. Have a great remainder of your day. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for joining everybody. Thanks.